Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, February the 10th, 2022. It is currently 9.31 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. Now, you can do a million things right, and no one's going to remember. However, if you do one thing wrong, no one will ever forget. You can do a million things right, and no one will remember, but if you do one thing wrong, no one will ever forget. Not only will they never forget, they will make sure you never forget because they will remind you and remind you and remind you. Do you feel the truth of that statement? Or maybe you don't feel the truth of that statement. Can you relate? You do a million things right and no one will remember, but you do that one thing wrong They will never forget. They will tell everyone they know what you've done wrong. They will brand you. They will remind you. They will destroy you with your guilt, with the wrong that you have done. Have you ever experienced that? Let me change the statement a little bit. Do a million things right, and you will never remember. But if you do one thing wrong, you will never forget. Do you relate this statement more to how other people act? Or do you relate it more to how you think and how you feel about yourself? Let me say it both ways. You can do a million things right and no one else will remember. You do one thing wrong No one else will ever forget. They will remind you and remind you and remind you and you'll be branded for life and you'll be known for the one thing you did wrong. Now, maybe you think, well, that's exaggerated. It it doesn't exactly work that way. Okay, but, but do you feel the weight of it? Now, let me say it the other way. Do a million things right and you will never remember, but you do the one thing wrong, you as an individual will never forget. I've experienced the, the, this statement really in both ways. I definitely have known that people will never let you forget. They will, I know that people will never forget the things that I have done wrong, but I know that I also, I cannot speak for anyone else, but I know that I obsess constantly over every single thing that I have ever done wrong. It at, at times it's almost maddening. I cannot speak for anyone else. Maybe, maybe maybe you cannot relate to this, and if you cannot relate to this, I understand. You, you may you may want to just skip this episode. But I, I think there's got to be some other people out there just like me. I cannot forget the things that I have done wrong. It's just weird. I can just be driving the car. I, I could be doing it, taking a shower, and it's just, all of a sudden my mind will just like, just remind me of, remember when you messed up then? Remember when you messed up then? Remember this? Remember that? Remember this? Remember, 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 remember. And I want to just scream, can't I remember anything that I've done right? Can I remember anything that I've done right? Because I clearly cannot forget the things that I have done wrong. Is it wrong to obsess over our guilt? Let me ask another question. Do you think Christianity does a good job in general in helping people overcome their guilt, their sin, their failures, their mistakes. Do you think Christianity is great at taking someone who has sinned, someone who has fallen, and restore them, build them back up, and help them get back to a place of usefulness? Or do you think Christianity is really good at maybe helping 
like if you initially get saved, they're really good with your, your, the sin you committed before you're saved. But once you're saved, if you commit certain sin, it's kind of like, well, sorry, you had your one chance. Like you got saved. That was your one chance. But now that you're saved, you've committed too many sins. So we can't help you. We don't even want to restore you. In fact, all we want you to do is to be remembered and destroyed about that sin. Do you think Christianity is, does a great job? of helping fellow believers when they fall, with handling their guilt? Or do you think Christianity simply adds to and just leads to a a very devastating cycle when it comes to people's failures and guilt? Well, what, what do you think? Now, the reason I'm asking all of these questions is because I don't even know what day it was. Let me see here if I have a date. February the 8th. February the 8th, 2022, I get um, an email from a, a, a ministry that I subscribe to their podcast. I subscribe to their like email, their email newsletter. I subscribe to a number of things from them. I don't always agree with everything they say, but I open my email inbox and there the subject line reads, do you obsess, obsess over your guilt? Do you obsess over your guilt? And as soon as I read that subject line, I was like, oh, wow. Okay, someone knows me very well. Someone this someone sent this email directly to me. Now, at first, I thought, I, I, at first, I didn't realize it was from this ministry. I thought someone was asking me, hey, do you obsess over your guilt? Because, hey, I'm, I'm really having a hard time. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I, maybe I can help this person because I clearly do obsess over my guilt. Uh, but, um, we're going to look through this article, and I'm just going to offer some like devotional thoughts, some some practical just points and ideas that I have in regards to this subject. It's a subject that I has has bothered me for a very long time, not only because of things I've experienced, but just because of the way I've seen it happen with other individuals. Let, let me explain, all right? Whenever something, and, and, and it, it just drives me crazy that I even have to describe it this way, but I do have to almost borrow from Catholic language here. Whenever someone commits that big sin, a mortal sin, a public scandalous sin, right? Because there's all kinds of sins people can commit that nobody ever gives much thought to. Nobody really cares about. Everyone kinds of ignores, kind of ignores. And you know that as well as I do, right? There are certain sins like, oh boy, that's big. We've got to talk about. And there's other sins are like, okay, well, you know, no one's perfect. It's really this really weird approach, but that's okay. You know what I mean? That when someone commits a big one, it's scandalous. It's horrible. It's, it's, it, it hurts people. It's devastating. I mean, it's just, it's really, really bad. There's almost a tendency within Christianity to almost act like, now I'm saying it feels like, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, is 100% accurate, but I think you'll know what I'm saying here. There's almost a tendency to feel like, okay, well, God's grace is sufficient, but not necessarily sufficient enough for that, right? It, it may be able to bring a little bit of forgiveness, but God's grace is not sufficient to not only forgive, but to restore. And now it's like, okay, you can be forgiven, but you, that's what you're going to be known for for the rest of your life. And so, and, and, and may, maybe you disagree, but I've just seen situations where someone commits a big sin and it doesn't seem like Christians come running to the person with a news of God's grace, with news of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, with news of forgiveness. It seems like Christians come running in with words of condemnation, words of rebuke, words of correction, and and words of almost accusing, well, there's no way that person can be saved. No way. That person's probably not even a Christian. They don't come running in. Think of it this way. A person falls into sin. Right, so they're they're laying there, broken, bloodied, bruised because of their fall, their sin. No excuse. They're the ones who messed up. They fell. Right, but Christians don't come running in with the medical kit. They they seem to come run in. They come running in with their podcast microphones. They come run in with their social media accounts, ready to put people on full blast and to expose and to destroy and to gossip and to slander 
not to say, okay, 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 okay. All right, everyone take a step back. Everyone take a step back. Move on. And then cover them in God's grace and mercy and say, okay, what you've done is by no means acceptable. Hopefully you understand that. You need to realize that you've committed a sin. And then they, they immediately go to work to put the person back together, to cover the wounds, to bandage the wounds, to restore, to heal, to put back together. It's almost like, no, it's like you messed up. You're forgotten. You're done. Kick them when they're down. And I know that that sometimes can be you. I know some people can say that. Look, it's easy to say when you've fallen into sin, going, hey, guys, don't kick me when I'm down. You know, forgive me, restore. I understand that there's a tendency maybe to, to try to get out of the responsibility of your sin by, by telling these kinds of stories. But I think the reality is that many times when people fall, Christians don't respond in the most gracious biblical way. It's almost like Christianity does not believe in battlefield medicine. I was in the military, as many people know, 19 years active duty before I had to, was medically retired because of what happened in anthrax. And I'm not going to go through everything that happened to me. And then I, I served as a, a civilian contractor for a couple more years. I think it was a total of 22 years. I was in the medical field when I was in the military. And, and, and our job was to, you know, during in a battle situation, in a, in a wartime situation, to set up, you know, medical stations to try to handle and, and to bring battlefield medicine to the wounded. Now, there were different, there were different places you would put your, your medical facilities. You'd have your, you know, battlefield medics who would be right there going out trying to bring the troops back to that first stage medical facility where you could only do the very basics. And then if needed to be, then people would be air evac out to a second level, then maybe to a third level and where you could do more and more uh, medical care. I don't want to go through the whole system, but th the point was that that idea that right there on the battlefield, medic, we need a medic and a medic would come running, doing the best that they could to put you together. The, the battlefield medics didn't run and go, well, you got yourself shot. Yeah. I mean, what were you doing? I mean, what were you thinking? I mean, come on, why didn't you take cover? Why didn't you do the right maneuver? Why, 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 what were you thinking? Man, look, look, I'm going to put some medicine on you, but you're going to have to pay the consequences here. No, the goal is to bandage, save, restore, get them hopefully back into the battle. Christianity doesn't seem to have battlefield medics running out there to put people back together to get them back into the, uh, to the, to the, to the battle. It's about, well, you messed up, you're garbage, you're done. We're sending you home and we're removing you from the, from the army. Uh, you're, you're no longer in the military because you're a failure because you got shot. And it's just a strange phenomenon that I have seen throughout my Christian life. Now, there are other situations where I think Christians show lots of grace and lots of mercy. There's some situation, but then there are other situations where it's just like, we're done with you. We're finished with you. You're done. You're, you know, you, 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 we, we used to love you, but now you've messed up. Now we're, we're finished with you. Now I'm not saying, listen, obviously I know that when a person falls into sin, there needs to be repentance. There needs to be acknowledgement of sin. I'm not saying if someone isn't willing to acknowledge their sin, they're not willing to repent of their sin. I understand that there are some situations, but I'm saying the general rule should be grace, mercy, medicine, restoration. I mean, they're, 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 look, they're, they're, at times there needs to be rebuke and correction, absolutely. But sometimes, look, the person's laying there battered and bloodied. Do we need to do, add some more rebuke? I mean, I think at that point, they, the, the person themselves know how much they have fallen. But I, it just seems a strange approach. But let me read a little bit of this article. Obviously, I have lots of feelings here about this, but let me read this. So I'm going to try to describe the article. So the headline, do you obsess over your guilt? Then it has a photograph of a woman and she has her head, her face down in her hands. Like, you know, like you would put your, you just drop your face into your hands, like you're frustrated or you're embarrassed or shame. She's covering her face. And then uh, across the picture, across the photograph, it says, do you obsess over your guilt? And then the article begins this way. Guilt is universal. Guilt is universal. 
Now, that is a very biblical and theological perspective. Guilt is universal. We are all guilty. We are all guilty. I wonder, do we really, 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 really believe that? We are good at pointing out everyone else's guilt, but when we're pointing at everyone else's guilt, do we, do we not realize and acknowledge our own guilt? Do we not see that I may not be guilty of what you did, but I'm plenty guilty of what I have done. I may not be guilty of what you did yesterday, but I guarantee you yesterday I was guilty of something. Because if we break one of God's law, we're guilty of all of it, right? Is that not a biblical principle? Right? Are we not all sinners in thought, word, and deed by what we do and fail to do? Do we not? Why is it that when someone sins, everyone runs to talk about that person's sin and everyone seems to forget that what you're talking about that person's sin, don't you have your own sin to confess? Don't you have your own sin to deal with? I'm not saying we ignore people's sin. I'm just saying that we seem to forget that guilt is universal. It's something we all are guilty of, right? And that, that's from a book called Guilt and Grace, page 152. I don't, I don't really need a book to tell me that guilt is universal, but this comes from a book, all right? And according to this book, you can do one of two things with that guilt. You can either repress it or recognize it. Repress it or recognize it. Now, I definitely understand the recognizing. I think repressing can be... I don't know if we have to actually an act of repression or it's just sometimes we ignore it. Maybe we deny it, but, but there's, they're, they're saying there's basically two ways of handling it. I'm going to say there's a right way of handling our guilt and there's a wrong way of handling our guilt. I'm going to simplify it. Instead of saying repress, repression and, and recognizing or recognition, I'm just going to say there's a right and wrong way. There's a right and wrong way to handle the guilt of others. There's the right and wrong way to handle guilt of ourselves. Like, I think there's a, a right and wrong way. And I think Christianity needs to re, to, I think all Christians need to stop and go, how do you handle the guilt of other people? And how do you handle your own guilt? Let's see what this article has to say. Repressing your guilt or handling your guilt in a wrong way leads to anger, rebellion, fear, and a, and, 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 and if I can speak correctly, anxiety, all right? I don't know why I'm having so many problems with that word, all right? So repressing your guilt or handling your guilt in a wrong way leads to anger, rebellion, fear, and anxiety. A deadening of conscience and increasing inability to recognize one's faults and a growing dominance of aggressive tendencies. Wow. That, that's a lot. If we, if we handle guilt the wrong way, right? If we repress it, ignore it, just what, however we want to describe it. I think there's a lot of wrong ways of handling guilt, but any wrong way of handling it, it says leads to anger. You become angry. Do you become angry at yourself? Or do you lash out at other people? Rebellion, fear, anxiety, a deadening of conscience, an increasing inability to recognize one's own fault and a growing dominance of aggressive tendencies. If you don't deal with your guilt correctly, you're going to, it's going to have profound impact on your spiritual life. And I think in many cases, if we don't handle our own guilt correctly, we will definitely not handle the guilt of other people correctly. I think the more we ignore our own guilt, the more we're not willing to acknowledge and recognize our own failure, we will become, I think we'll become even more, I think we'll become qu quicker in pointing out everyone else's failure. I think, I think one of the ways some people handle their own failure is by pointing out everyone else's failure. Like, you're like, you know, okay, yeah, I, I, even kids do this. Mom, I, yeah, I did it, but... But so did Tommy across the street. He did it as well. We, we always want to point out someone else's guilt because it's almost like if other people committed the same thing, then I don't feel as bad. And I think for many Christians, they love hearing about everyone else's failures because it makes them feel somehow morally superior. That's a lot of possible problems that can just arise. And listen, 
even if you go to a counselor, right? Even if you go to a, a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist, I, I, you, will, you will hear that one of the major issues that people struggle with is guilt, handling their own guilt. And it leads to all kinds of problems. So do you handle your guilt correctly and do you handle everyone else's guilt correctly? In other words, this is interesting, repressing your guilt only leads to behavior that increases it. So if we mishandle our guilt, it will increase behavior that should increase your guilt because you're not, well, especially from a biblical perspective, you're not going to be acting correctly. You're not going to be, you're not going to be handling yourself in a biblical manner. I will say this, if we don't handle guilt correctly, I think, I don't, I think if we don't handle other people's guilt correctly, if we don't handle our own guilt correctly, it will increase attitudes and actions that are unbiblical. It, it, will, it will be detrimental to our spiritual life. On the other hand, recognizing your guilt leads to repentance, to the peace and security of divine pardon, and in the and that way to a the article is uh, something just popped up on the article. Okay, let me read this again. On the other hand, recognizing your guilt leads to repentance, to the peace and security of divine pardon, and in that way to a progressive refinement of conscience and a steady weakening of aggressive impulses. So they're saying if we, if we recognize our guilt, we handle our guilt in a correct way, it will lead to repentance, to peace, to security of divine pardon, and in that way, to a progressive refinement of conscience and a steady weakening of aggressive impulses. Whether you repress or recognize your guilt may be influenced by the type of religion you practice. The author of the book, Guilt and Grace, says that there are religions of moralism and religions of grace. So one of the things that determine how you handle your guilt is the type of religion you practice. Now, I will argue that within Christianity, there is some Christianities, some forms of Christianity that's more moralism, and there are others that are more grace-based. Do you practice a Christianity that's moralistic, or do you practice a Christian that is grace-focused and grace-based? Now, here's what happens if you say grace-based, someone said, oh, you're talking easy believism. You're talking about, you know, not looking at sin seriously. You're just excusing sin. You just want to excuse, 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 and let anybody live any way they want. You're abusing the grace of God. It's cheap grace. It's wrong. That's usually the accusation that will come. In many cases, they will say all of those things. It sounds biblical. It sounds spiritual. It sounds super spiritual. But in many cases, they reduce religion to a very moralistic approach. Moralism or grace. Let's go in and see what they have to say here. The author, again, of the book Guilt and Grace, adds that moralistic religions make the guilt problem worse. A moralistic religion is a basically is a a, a a a kind of a deformed form of religion, and it's saturated with the ideas of taboos and pictures God as a threatening being, awakens fear, and sets in motion the sinister mechanism, uh, basically of creating more wrong, revolt, and wickedness. So when when you have a moralistic relig- religion, it's a def- it's a it's it's deformed. It's a deformed view of everything. A moralistic religion deforms our understanding of God, of grace. It just messes up everything, and it really only increases the problem. It leads to more rebellion. It leads to more wrong behavior. It leads to wickedness. They go on to say, in other words, by emphasizing rules and regulations— Moralistic religion produces exactly what Paul warned that law-based religions produce, even more sin. 
So they say if you emphasize the rules, 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 you will actually increase that behavior. It's going gonna, it's gonna to produce even more sin. Now, they point to Romans chapter 7. We'll look at it quickly. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of, uh, of, of sin. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be under unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. I think what they want you to realize here is that the law is there, but all the law did was reveal more sin. All the law did was, in fact, what did it say here? Um, that by, by, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of of, of wrongdoing, all manner of sin. Okay, it, it just led to more sin, that, that, that actually the law awakened it. The law, it's almost like, here's what the law does, and, and we, we studied this in our series in Romans. The law almost, like, the more you hear the law, it awakens the sin. It almost sets it more into motion. It brings it, it, it almost creates it, gives it even a greater passion to do it. It's like the more you say, don't do it, the more your, your sinful nature will say, I need to do it. So they're saying that a law-based, a moralistic rule-based will actually increase more sin. Okay. I, I think there's a, we, I mean, we, I, I don't like just going to those verses in Romans 7 and just immediately just, you know, ripping them somewhat out of context. But since I have preached on it, I can say that there is a little bit of, there's definitely some truth to this concept. And we definitely talked about it a lot in our study of Romans chapter seven. So just keep that idea in mind that the concept is this, that where, that basically where there's law, right? Where there's rules, it's going to, it's a a law-based religion, a law-based approach to Christianity will produce actually more sin. But that's something to at least consider. The alternative to a law-based religion or a moralistic Christianity is a religion of grace. And they say that this can break into this vicious circle and lead to repentance and thus the freedom from guilt. Grace can actually break the cycle and actually free you from guilt. When you read the Bible, you can find both kinds of verses, frightening verses that speak about judgment and comforting verses that speak to God's grace. Ironically, in the psychiatric practice, the author of this book found that people were adept at picking out the passages in scripture that did not apply to them. What he means is that the author found that people who were smugly self-righteous who flaunt their self-satisfaction at the cost of a repression of their guilt, who scorn and pass judgment upon other people and flatter themselves on their virtues, were the ones who noticed passages that spoke about the assurance of grace and ignored the passages about judgment. So a lot of the people who are very self-righteous, very self-righteous and seem to be so quick at condemning everyone else, seem to be very quick at knowing those passages that speak about, this is just crazy, that they, that they actually are quick to, to focus on the passages that speak of grace. So, so they, it's really weird, they ignore the ones about judgment, they know the ones about grace, and they apply the words of grace to themselves and apply the words of judgment basically to other people. In other words, when it comes to themselves, they know the grace passage. When it comes to judgment, they know that for everyone else. That's not, that's, 
we need to take the judgment passages and apply them to ourselves first. And we should be quick to apply the passages of grace to everyone else. We seem to have it reversed. Now, I, at the same time, we need those words of grace to ourselves, yes, because we're talking about obsessing with guilt ourselves. But I'm just saying, when it comes to how we handle other people, meanwhile, the people who are most aware of their own sins and the most racked by guilt overlooked the grace passages and occupied themselves with verses that spoke about God's judgment. Those who are just absolutely overwhelmed with guilt, they seem to, we, And I can speak for myself here, since I'm definitely the one constantly overwhelmed by guilt. I I tend, I what I tend to do is forget the passages about grace, and and I I try to apply them to other people. But I am no matter how many times I remind myself of them for me. I, I, I always feel like, well, okay, yes, I know God says he'll forgive me. I know, I know God says that, that, you know, he can cover all of my sins and he, and I know all of these passages, but, but and, and I almost, I hesitate to apply them to myself because I feel like I'm excusing my sin. I feel like I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I feel like that I, I'm using them like a get out of, a get out of jail free card. Or, or no matter how many times I remind myself of them, I know that other people don't see me in light of those grace passages. So I, I, I struggle at this point. But it says people who are most aware of their own sins and the most racked by guilt overlook the grace passages and occupy themselves with verses that speak about God's judgment. Again, the author of this book says, instead of drawing from the Bible, the marvelous consolation, which is there precisely for them, they have a morbid passion for haunt, hunting out text on the severity of God, his wrath, curses, and punishment. For example, the author explains how many clients obsessively worried about committing the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or of reaching the point of being impossible to be restored to repentance. And then they would look at Mark 3, 29 and Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, which I think is a complete misapplication of Hebrews 6, but we won't get into all of that, all right? They say, so what what can be done? What can be done? Uh, Following a long line of theologians who distinguish between law and gospel, this author says we need both passages, but at different times for different people. We need the assurance of grace to meet our convictions of guilt, and we need the severity of God to drive us back upon ourselves to the recognition of our guilt and misery and to make us entrust ourselves still more ardently to the divine grace. So in other words, what they're saying is, and this is a very popular concept within a Lutheran theology that really needs to influence all of us, is that we need both law and grace. There's times I need law. There's times I need to be reminded, you have sinned. I need times to remind myself of that. There's Everyone needs to hear the law passages and be reminded, this is what God commands you, you have fallen short. But at the same time, we constantly need the grace passages to remind us of God's forgiveness, that God's grace is sufficient, that God can cut, wipe away all of our sins. He can completely make us white as snow. He can change us and, and completely forgive us 100%. We, and remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. We need to be reminded of that. But here's the thing. We also need to remind, uh, we need to be quick to remind others of God's grace and apply God's grace to other people. We need both. If you are highly sensitive to your sins, focus all your Bible reading on the passages that list all the reasons why you should, why, why you should be condemned. See, if you are highly sensitive to your sins, focus and focus all of your Bible reading on the passages that list all the reasons why you should be condemned, then I would urge you to stop and turn your attention elsewhere. You have heard one side of the biblical story, the law side. Now it's time for you to listen to the other side, the grace side. Yes, you are a sinner, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Yes, you are ungodly, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, Romans 4, 5. 
Yes, you do deserve wrath. But much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. However great your sins are, Jesus' love and work for you are greater. Now, I want to apply this both ways. When you see other people and you're like, that person's a sinner. That person fell into horrible sin. They embarrass the name of Jesus. Now, you may want immediately for them to be punished and destroyed and removed and crucified, even even if you're not literally talking about, you know, being crucified. But I'm saying you just want them publicly destroyed and removed. How about you reminding yourself that that person is a sinner? But God demonstrated his own love towards that person and that while they were yet a sinner, Christ died for them. How how about about you do that? How about the next time you see someone who has done something horrible and ungodly? How about you look to them and you say, yes, that person is ungodly, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans 4, 5. How about the next time you see someone else? You're like, yeah, that person deserves wrath. But then you say, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we are saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 9. How about the next time you see someone else's sin, you remind yourself that the the love, work, and grace of Christ is greater than that person's sin. And then the next time you look in the mirror and you see yourself and you're like, man, that person right there is a sinner. Everyone knows that person. is. No one can forget what that person has done wrong. When you see yourself, remind yourself, but God demonstrated his own love towards me. And that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me, Romans 5, 8. How about the next time you look in the mirror and you're like, man, that person is ungodly. You say, but to, to me, who, who does not work, but believe on him who justifies the ungodly. My faith is accounted for righteousness, Romans 4, 5. How about the next time you look in the mirror and you're like, that person deserves wrath. You're like, much more than having now been justified by his blood, I shall be saved through, uh, from wrath through Christ, Romans 5, 9. In other words, you need to learn to state those, those v- verses towards other people and towards yourself. Sometimes we cover our own guilt by being self-righteous jerks to everyone else. Sometimes we cover our own guilt by condemning everyone else. Sometimes we condemn our own guilt by acting like Pharisees and Sadducees instead of being people who are filled with grace. We've got to be able to recognize our own sin and forgive ourselves and then take that forgiveness and share it willingly with everyone else. We're almost afraid or, or almost like, okay, here, I'm holding a journal here, but just feel like this is a container of God's grace. I'm like, okay, I've got God's grace. I see that person over there, but mm, I wonder, do they deserve it? I don't know if they, you know, I want them to know they're forgiven, but I also want them to know that they, they can't do the following 12 things because I have determined that they cannot do those things. It's so weird how we, how we handle people in the Bible versus how we handle people around us, right? We have no problem at all (laughs) saying, all right, kids, today you're going to learn about David, King David. He was a great guy and he did this and we got no problem like, and and we're going to look at the Psalms, which David wrote. We got no problem putting him forth as a hero of the faith and we almost ignore the wrong he did. Now, we may preach the wrong he did, but we just preach it like it's a lesson for us to learn. Here, here, here's almost how we use David's failure. Okay, David fell, this, David fell horribly into sin. He committed murder, he committed adultery, he covered it up. Horrible. Now, we, we teach it as a moral lesson. Hey, so that none of you mess up. We, 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 don't, we don't teach it like, okay, it, wouldn't David's story also show that if you do fall into this horrible sin, Clearly, there's forgiveness and restoration. I mean, David goes on to write actual scripture. 
He's used by God to write actual scripture. I know a lot of people say, but, but, but he didn't get to build the temple. I, I love when people say that. See, this is, we know that there are circ, I mean, the baby died and he didn't get to build the temple. So see, if you commit David's sin, your baby should die and you don't get to build the temple. No, we all apply it to, you don't get to do this. You don't get to do this. Well, wait a minute. David wrote scripture. And if you want to talk about someone, look who built the temple. Solomon, right? Let's see, a absolute serial adulterer, polygamist, I mean, give me a break. He, he, was, he took David's adultery and said, stand back. Let me show you how to really commit adultery. I'm going to have so many women that I'm going to be known. For, but no, we, we overlook Solomon. We're like, hey, read the Proverbs. Read what Solomon wrote. Wait, wait. So we're going to listen to someone teach us about God who was a serial adulterer? We just overlook it. Now, if someone in real life commits the sin David committed, or commits the never-ending sin that Solomon committed, we would be like, they're done. They're destroyed. And we, we, would, we, would, we don't forgive. We don't forget. I think it's interesting. If you go to Hebrews 11, if you go to Hebrews 11, it mentions all the so-called heroes of the faith. Abraham is mentioned. But guess what's not mentioned? Any of the failures that Abraham made. I mean, Abram had relations with another woman. Abram lied. But that's all just overlooked. Moses is mentioned. Is Moses' murder mentioned? That he murdered someone? Is it mentioned that he didn't even get to go into the promised land? Some other people are mentioned here in Hebrews, which I think is really, really bizarre. Let me let's see. I, I, I'll give you some names here. See if, you, if you're just like, wait, Samson is mentioned. Not, not all of his sins, not all of his failures. He's mentioned here almost as a hero of the faith. David is mentioned. Why can these people be mentioned as if they didn't even commit? These are heroes of the faith. Samson would Samson, Samson would be literally destroyed in Christian public opinion in in 2022. He'd be considered he wouldn't even be considered saved. And it may, it reminds me a very important passage that is constantly I think ripped out of context. 2 Corinthians 5:17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, we always read that as, no, that's what practically happens when you become a Christian. See, we, we turn this into a, more. we turn everything into moralism, right? Hey, see, you're a Christian now. You're a new creature. Old is gone. Everything is new. So you should not be sinning. Well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, we know that that's just not even, that doesn't even make any sense from a biblical, logical argument. Because we all know we still have the old nature. So if we still have the old nature, then clearly all things have not become new. So it cannot be referring to us in a practical way because practically it's just not true. Any, unless you believe in the eradication of the old nature and believe people can be perfect. We know that all things have not become new because we keep sinning. So what does this verse mean? We'll just go back to the verse right before it. Wherefore, henceforth, no, no, we, no man after the flesh. Yea, they, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth, no, we, him, no more. We don't know anyone after the flesh. In other words, I don't see someone after the flesh, seeing them as a sinner. I see them uh, by their position. In, I see people in, in the light of their position before God. Before God, they are a new creature in Christ. The old is gone. Everything has become new because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. I see per, a person in light of their, their the imputed righteousness of Christ, not based off their practical righteousness or the lack thereof. When I see a fellow believer, I see someone who is completely forgiven, completely declared to be righteous and holy, and completely obedient because, obedient because they are covered in the imputed righteousness of Christ. I don't know them after the flesh. I see them now in light of their position. 
But we've ripped that out of context and we make it this even, okay, oh, look what you did. Well, you shouldn't be doing that. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things are gone. I'll, well, wait a minute. You sin too. We, we completely rip it out of its context. We have to learn to see people in light of God's mercy and grace and the imputed righteousness, his passive and active obedience being imputed to our account by faith. That's the whole beauty of Christianity. Christianity will should be the very medicine that people need when they are broken in their sin. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, it is wrong. But in Christ Jesus, you are perfect. You are forgiven. You are assured of eternal life. Your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, but all we can do is go, you have sinned. You have sinned. We are never going to let you forget. Now, there's some sins we will quickly overlook. There's some sins we'll just like, okay, that's okay. No, no one's perfect. But then there are others. And, and tell me, where is God's grace most needed? When there's horrible sin, Right? Now, I I want other people to experience God's grace and forgiveness. I want other people to be freed from the from the never-ending cycle of being uh, obsessing over your guilt. I don't want you to excuse your guilt. No. I I don't want you to ever excuse it. I don't want you to ever forget it. But I want you to rest in the fact that it's been forgiven and covered by the blood of Christ and get up and move on. Now, I want you to experience that I struggle still experiencing that. I still struggle. Because I, no matter how many times I, I remember my, my guilt, I've, I, or put it this way, no matter how many times I try to remind myself of God's grace and his mercy and of the imputed righteousness and of forgiveness, I, I just cannot... I cannot forget my own mistakes and my own failure. I think, I think it's because... I think it's because I want, you know what? I want to be. I, I, it's because I know that other people know of my mistakes and failures. And I know that they will never forget my mistakes and failures. So therefore I can't. In other words, I think I'm trapped by how other people may remember my failure where I only wanted them to know all of my success. But that not that more about my own ego? Isn't that about my own pride? See, I want everyone to think I'm great. I want everyone to think I'm wonderful. I want everyone to think that I'm perfect. See, as long as, that, as if, if other people think that about me, then I feel free. See, I'm more worried about what other people think, what I, what I can't worry about what other people think. Well, I mean, yes, you want to acknowledge to them, yes, I'm a failure and I'm a sinner and I make no excuses about it. But at the same time, I can't live in light of their perspective on me. I have to live my life in light of the truth that scripture tells me is about my position, that in Christ, I am holy, I am perfectly righteous, and all my sins have been forgiven. Now, I, I want remi- to I I just be reminded of my sin, just enough, though. I don't want to completely forget my sin. I think we always need at least a, a, a little remembrance of it, because the more you remember it, I think it, it should keep you humble, and it should make you the most grace based and grace focused person you can be when it deals with other people. There's so much more I want to say, but I, th- I really, I, I was going to give you like some, some individual points, but I'm not, I'm, I just think the talking through that is worth more than just now me. I, I don't, because I want you to process it. I want you to write down some points, right? I want you to write down and I want you to just think about how, how does Christianity actually handle people's failures? How do you handle failure of other people? And how do you handle your own guilt? You know, we we started this, or I should say I started this, by reading, again, that, that famous phrase, that famous quote that I think is important. Do a million things right and no one remembers. Do one thing wrong and no one ever forgets. I think we need to say it this way. Do a million things right. No one else may remember. In fact, really, you can do all the things right in the world, and it really, that doesn't even matter if you remember. It doesn't matter if anyone remembers the things I do right. Do one thing wrong, 
No one ever forgets. That is true. No one may ever forget. You know what? You may never forget. But here's what we do. Whether I do a million things right or whether I do a million things wrong, what I have to constantly remember is the forgiveness that is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I need to constantly see others and myself, not according to the flesh, but I need to see that I am a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away, all things have become new because that is true of me positionally. Practically, I'm still a sinner. Practically, I am still a sinner with a sinful nature who will fall into sin. Sometimes grievous sins, sometimes insignificant sins. Now, we all say we believe that until someone falls into sin and then we're like, how dare you? Now, we want you punished. Wherever sin occurs and you are in others, it needs to be, it needs God's grace and mercy. I need to be reminded of who I am in Christ. I need to be reminded that I am covered in the imputed righteousness of Christ and his perfect and act of obedience. So in Christ, I am perfectly obedient. In Christ, I am not a sinner. In Christ, I have not sinned. In Christ, I am perfectly righteous. In practice, I'm still a sinner. The world doesn't understand it. Sadly, many Christians seem to forget it. We, we, instead of running to bring God's mercy, we're like, well, I don't know if that person's really saved. I don't know if that per- I don't think that person was really saved. I don't think that person's really saved. I don't think that person's really saved. Now, and then we start thinking about, so what punishment do they need? What, what, what's the consequences? What's the consequence? We immediately want to start talking consequences and punishment, not mercy and grace. We don't even think restoration. We think, or we, we think of, of how, to, how to end the person. Praise God that Peter could deny Jesus three times and be restored to usefulness. David could commit a horrible wrong and still be used by God to write scripture. Solomon don't even, can't even tell you how many wrongs he committed, still used by God to write scripture and to build the temple. God's grace, God's mercy. Greater than all of our sin, your sin and the sin of others. Something to think about on this Thursday, February the 10th, 2022. All right, thanks for listening. You can email me your thoughts about this, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks for listening. God bless.